Proverbs chapter 4. Let me read down through verse 9. And let me remind you that this is the word of our Lord. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father, and give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live, acquire wisdom, acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will guard over you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom and with all your acquiring, get understanding. Prize her and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we just praise you and we thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning, the privilege of worship. Thank you for calling us into relationship with yourself through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death and his burial and his resurrection. Thank you for reconciling us to yourself. Thank you for allowing his death to stand in the place of our death and for his life to be poured out for our sins. And so, Father, we meet in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. We also praise you for your word. Father, thank you for filling the minds of men and guiding their hands as they lifted the pen and wrote the word of God down for us. Help us to understand it for what it is. Help us to study it with our whole heart and apply it to our whole lives and live in a way that glorifies you in every area. Father, we ask for your spirit to work among us this morning. Give my failing mouth, my lisping tongue, the words. Give my mind clarity, Father, so that I can communicate with truthfulness and with boldness of speech. And then help my heart as well as all of our hearts to hear what it is that your word says to us. and Help us to meet your word in humble repentance and belief. Lord, all this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, I'm not intentionally dodging Romans. It probably seems like that. Um, but what I'm planning on doing for the next few weeks, I, don't, I really don't know how long. It may just be next week or it, it may spill into over several weeks. I want to take on the subject of preaching to men and what it means to be a godly man. We used to meet several years ago over my garage on a weekly basis, I think it was, or maybe it was twice a a month. And many of us gathered uh, over many, many, many weeks and we had these sort of conversations and helping sharpen one another and instructing in the word and helping men to understand what it means to be a man of God. Of course, we haven't been able to do that in some time. Uh, It could be the fact that y'all, you guys have kids now and we would have had 80 kids in the home instead of what we had back then is 20. But anyway, I miss those times and I I still look upon those times as some of our most productive effort in ministry from this church. And so since the last two years, we haven't been able to do very much at all together. I want to spend the next few weeks talking about what it means to be a godly man. And that may spill into what it means to be a godly woman. Uh, I don't know yet, but I'm praying through those things. But eventually we will get to the book of Romans and we'll settle into that. And it will be a great long period of time that we'll walk through that. But I don't know how long I'll be uh, even this morning. We may just simply get through the introduction of giving us some thoughts as we approach what it means to be a godly man. But however far we get, I'll keep a watch on the clock and I promise to stop close to time. But you know as well as I do, you're smiling at me even now. You probably think I just lied to you. You know as well as I do that there are but two final destinations for men. Very few people argue with that. They don't even have to be of the Christian faith. 
There are many people of false faiths that fall into that category, accepting the reality that there's either heaven or there's hell. In fact, there are many people that are irreligious altogether, ungodly, have no concern about God, no knowledge of God. Still, they have some sort of concept that in the end, there will be some sort of judgment based on some sort of thing or things. And then we will arrive at our final destination, whatever that may be. But we understand it very clearly because of the word of God that there is only heaven or hell. So if there's only two destinations, that means there can only be two roads to travel. One road that will take you into the presence of God and the glories of heaven forever. And the other road that will take you into the wrath of God and punishment forever. Now, the world hates the idea of what I just said. The world wants options. The world wants to choose what path they want. They want to choose the number of paths that they take. And some of them even want to choose very many different destinations for the souls of men. In fact, most of them would say that there are many ways to heaven. But that can't be true. Because if that were true, that book that's lying in your lap right now is absolutely worthless. In fact, Jesus Christ would be a liar if there are many roads to heaven because our Lord said himself, I am the way. And then he goes on to say there is no way to the presence of the Father. No man, not one single person can come to the Father but through me. So if Jesus is very exclusive, and he is in that statement, saying that I am the only means by which you can obtain a relationship with God, I am the only person through which you can enter into heaven, if that's not true, that makes him a liar, and we don't even have a Savior at this point if there's more than one way to heaven, you see. There is only one way, and you'd be surprised at the number of men that have waffled over that over the years. From Joel Osteen all the way to Billy Graham have waffled on that one point, even on public television. Joel Osteen answers that question, well, 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 I don't know. That's what he says a number of times when he got pinned down. Is there only one way to heaven? And he goes, well, well, I don't know. And when Billy Graham was asked that same question many years ago on, on live television, he responded, oh, there's many ways, but they all go through Jesus Christ. They might not know the name of Christ. They might be Muslims or Buddhist or what have you, but they will enter into heaven through Jesus Christ. And he never recanted that statement. But that's not what our Lord says. Our Lord says, I am the way Period. There is no other way. The Bible even says there's no other name in heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Ultimately, then, there is only one way to heaven, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, then, there is only one way to hell, and that is your way. And you're on one of those two roads this morning. You're either on the way of the Lord or you're on your way. The Lord's way takes you to glory and your way will take you to hell. Now, I do realize that there's a great many occupations to choose from, to work and provide for your families. There is endless number of pastimes and interests and pleasures to enjoy. There's a great many places to live, to raise your family. But there are only two ways in which any of those things can be accomplished. And that is a way that glorifies God or a way that glorifies yourself. I don't care if you're sitting in a deer stand. There's a way to do that in which God can be glorified. And there's a way to do that in which you can be glorified. And so we have to realize that as Christians, when we claim to be on the right way, that affects every area of our life. Now, the Bible helps us understand these things. And the Bible is, well, it's the wisdom of God. And so it's perfect in every way. But it takes these spiritual things that I'm talking about right now and it gives them physical illustrations for us to help us understand these particular ways that I'm talking about. And every time in Scripture, there's, well, there's a handful of words, but they all mean similar things. For instance, when we talk about this direction that we're going in, this spiritual direction, the Bible will use the words path or the Bible will use the word way almost always every time. It's the path or the way to a particular place. Again, that's the direction of life or that's the summary of life. 
And then when it's using those phrases, it almost always, always, Old Testament, New Testament, uses the word walk to describe how we're doing in the moment. What our present tense experience is. How are you walking? Now, if I ask you that, I hope immediately your mind would think godly or ungodly. And I think most of you, that would be the case if I said, how are you walking these days? You would either thankfully and humbly say, by faith, or you would drop your head, not look me in the eye and just shake your head, no. Meaning I'm not walking in a way that pleases the Lord. So the Bible uses these illustrations to try to help us grasp these particular paths or these particular roads or these particular ways. In fact, let me show you the passage that grabs both of these very clearly. And let me talk about this for just a second before we start reading through this. We've been walking through the Psalms on Sunday night. I think we're all the way to Psalms 35. It's, it's going to be a few years before we see the end of Psalms, right? But you remember, I, I've told you a number of times that the book of Psalms is so precious and you should read one every day because it is all of this truth and all of this theology put into practical experience. The Psalms is the Word of God made alive in your life and you should spend every day in the Psalms somewhere. Now Psalms 1 is fascinating because this is the introduction to 150 Psalms. Psalms 1 and 2 introduces the entire book to us. Now I want you to see how David introduces the entire book of Psalms to us in Psalm 1. He says, how blessed is the man who does not walk, here we go, in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked, they're not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And look at his conclusion to his introduction. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's your two roads. One of those roads leads to heaven, and that's the way of righteousness, and the other road leads to hell, and that's the way of the wicked. Now, as I said, the Bible gives us all kinds of phrases that are really nothing more than synonyms, so let me read some of these to you. Here's the heavenly road. It's the way of life. It's the way of the Lord. It's the way of righteousness, the way of understanding, the way of good men, the path of life, the path of your commandments, the path of the upright, the way of peace, the way of truth. Job provides one of my favorite ones. He doesn't use path or way. Job simply says this. It's the fear of the Lord to describe that path to glory. In the New Testament, hopefully you know this, the book of Acts, it's used a number of times. And he simply says the way to help us understand. Now we're going to be in the book of Proverbs this morning. So Proverbs likes to use the way of wisdom. Now there is a road, like I said, that leads to hell. And listen to these phrases that the Bible likes to use. It's the way of death. It's the way of the wicked. It's the way of evil. The path of the wicked. The way to Sheol. The way of the lazy. Peter says it's the way of Balaam. Jude says it's the way of Cain. And Proverbs likes to call it the way of the fool. And so when you read through the book of Proverbs, you're going to see that a number of times, the way of wisdom or the way of the fool to help us understand, again, these two paths. Now, you're in Proverbs chapter 4, and I just read part of that to you. But I want you to turn over to, to verse 14. Now, again, I'll flesh this out over the weeks ahead, but Solomon is speaking to his son. And he's exhorting him to pick the right path, to choose the right road to walk down. In fact, he's pleading with him not to pick the wrong path. 
and you get an understanding of the number of times that he's pleading him that there's an exit or there's an on ramp, if you will, not an exit. There's an on ramp of every day of life to get on the path of the way of the wicked and the way of the fool. And so this father is begging his younger son to pay very careful attention of what road that he's walking down. So we have verse 14 and 15 where the warning comes. Listen to these. He says, do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Don't pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. So there's your exhortation. But then Solomon breaks these two roads down and he just begins to describe them. Notice verse 16. For they, the wicked, cannot sleep unless they do evil. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. In other words, those who travel this road will oftentimes give up rest in order that they can sin. They'll stay up late and avoid sleep just so they can have more time to satisfy their own fleshly desires and rebel against God. Look at verse 17. They eat the bread of wickedness. They drink the wine of violence. But in verse 18... The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter and brighter until the full day. The way of the wicked is like darkness and they do not know over what they stumble. Now, if you were to ask most men, what path are you on? And you begin to describe these two paths like I just did for you this morning. Almost every single man would go, well, I'm not evil And I'm not wicked, so I am not on the path that leads to hell. But the problem with that is all men overestimate their own heart. And they do not realize that if you're going your way, you're on the path of wickedness and evil. You're moving away from God because, as I said, the Bible says either you're going the way of the Lord or you're going your own way. And so the Bible lumps these phrases in to help us describe our own way. It's the way of wickedness. It's the way when you are your own God. And so the Bible refers to that as evil. Another passage that I meant to mention, Proverbs 14 helps us to understand the heart of man. It says this, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And without the grace of God, you cannot convince a man that he's on the wrong road or he's on the wrong way because he thinks his he thinks his way is acceptable to the Lord. We're not born on the path of life. We're not found in the way of wisdom and then later choose to exchange it for a path of wickedness. We're actually born on the wrong path. We're born pointing and walking in the wrong way. We're even well on our way down the wrong road before we ever even realize we're on a road. And the reason for that, and I ask you, where would you turn to help us understand the reason for the fact that we're born on the wrong road? Hopefully almost everybody in the room would go Genesis chapter three. You see, when Adam rejected God, When Adam rebelled against God, disobeyed God and became his own God and did what he wanted to do, he picked his own way over God. And he placed all of humanity on the wrong road leading away from God. Now, I realize that there's some men that don't like that. I realize that all of you do do understand that. But you do realize that God works by representation. I'm so thankful that when I get to glory, God will accept the righteous work of Jesus Christ on my behalf. I'm so thankful that I will not see the wrath of God because Jesus Christ hung on the cross and swallowed the wrath of God in my place. I'm so thankful that I won't be held accountable for my sin because Jesus Christ shed his blood for my sin. I'm so thankful that Christ and Christ alone represents me. But you do need to understand that there was a time when another represented you. And if you're without Christ, that man still represents you. And that's Adam. 
when he, as the first man, stood before God and God gave him a command and he rejected that command, he cast all of us not into this idea that we have a propensity towards sin. No, he brought death upon us all in rebellion. In fact, read the very next chapter in the book of Genesis because the very first murder takes place in chapter 4. And chapter 5 is a long record of death because what of at what Adam has done. We are born to exalt ourselves. We are born to pursue self. It's just a natural thing for us because of our father. That's why the Bible says this when it speaks to us about the Lord. My mom put this or my mom bought a, a, a bookmark for me when I was very young. I, I still got that somewhere. Used to have it in my Bible that I would read every day. And this was the Bible passage on that bookmark. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, what do so many people say today? And in fact, so many of the people in the church say today, trust your heart. The Bible never tells you to trust your heart. The Bible tells you to take your heart and cast its full weight into trusting the Lord. Your heart is wicked and deceitful. Don't go around just trusting that heart within you. The Bible says, no, trust the Lord with all of your heart. Look what it says. Do not lean on your own understanding. Don't do that. Don't walk about life. Even you young people that are old enough to listen. Don't walk about life thinking, well, I can figure this out. I've just got to see what's in my heart. I can realize it by my own willpower or my own understanding. I can figure this thing out. Listen, that's the wrong road. That's the way of the fool. That's the way of death. If you want to be on the right road, you'll ignore your heart and you'll trust in the Lord with every ounce of that. You won't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, you will acknowledge God and His Word. And you will find yourself on an entirely different road. If we do not turn from the wrong way, we will continue to make progress down the path of darkness and death. Now, I realize obviously more men or, or uh, some men rather make progress much more quickly down the road of evil. Some men go much further down the road of evil. But you have to understand it's all the same road. Whether you're on exit one or exit 200 in your own way, you do understand you're on the exact same road. You think about sexual immorality. The church has pitched such a, a fit over the last few years over homosexuality and, and rightly so. But where were, why were they pitching a fit about sexual immorality when people who were unmarried were living together? Why were they pitching a fit about sexual immorality when a man left his woman and the church just let him continue to come and sit on a pew and not repent publicly? For certainly he cheated against her publicly. Why wouldn't we rebuke him publicly? Certainly he made a fool out of her publicly. So why wouldn't, rebu why wouldn't we rebuke him over his sin publicly? You see, it's all the same road. Whether it's sexual immorality as a teenager or it's homosexuality as an adult, it's all the same road. It's all the way of death. And so whether we're on exit one or we're on exit 200, you're going the wrong way if you're doing your own thing. The Bible says that we need to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and do not lean on our own understanding. As I said, the path of life is not natural for us. We cannot discover this path of life within ourselves. If you diligently search your heart, you will not find it there. It cannot be found by crossing your legs and sitting in silence and in meditation for a great many days on top of a mountain. That makes for really cool Marvel movies, but it does nothing for your life. The path of life is outside of us. It's beyond us. It's above us. We must be shown and we must be taught and we must be trained in the way of wisdom. So let me ask you a question. Where is the way of wisdom? Where can we find it? You have your Bible. I want you to turn. You're in Proverbs 4. Just turn a couple of pages back to the left to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, we know who wrote it. It tells us in the very first verse, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David. 
In the second verse, he tells us exactly why he's writing this book, and it's to know wisdom and instruction. But in verse 7, he comes to the end of his introduction and he tells us where it can only be found. And what does it say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In chapter 9, he'll say the very exact same thing, except he'll say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, you can't find it anywhere until you humble yourselves and come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. It is the fear of God that we begin to understand the right way in the path that leads to glory. When we get to Romans 1, we'll talk about this. God has revealed himself through creation. You can actually walk outside and see the glory of the stars and of the moon and the suns. You can see the mountains and the lakes and the rivers and the oceans. And you can be awestruck and realize if you have a brain whatsoever, you can realize that God has created all of this. And it's absolutely marvelous. And you can be drawn to that God in fear and realize that I must be held accountable to him if he made everything. And it's in drawing to him in that fear that we begin to understand his wisdom and then come to faith later on. I don't think this word is unique with Solomon. In fact, his dad may have said it first. If David wrote Psalms 111, David says the very same thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But I don't even know if David was first because Job came before David. So turn back to Job 28 with me. Look what Job says. Go back to the left. Hopefully you've already marked it. Job 28. And notice with me verse 12. Job writes, Where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Jump ahead to verse 23. And look what Job writes. God understands its ways. He knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth. He sees everything under the heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind and he meted out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it, he declared it, he established it, and he searched it out. And notice verse 28, And to man God has said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. I think Job was the first to write these words, and Job wrote the words from the Father. And so we understand from God, if you want to understand the way, if you want to understand the right path, the way of righteousness, the way of life, it begins with a fear of God. This truth is consistent throughout the pages of Scripture. It is the way of life, it is the path of wisdom, and it lies solely with the Lord. It cannot be found apart from God. It is found in no other place. And so since this is God's word, we have to understand that wisdom is lying in your lap if you have an open Bible right there, right now. That is the wisdom of God that has been made known to us by what men have written down. And once men humbly turn to the Lord and to his word, life, knowledge, Wisdom flows graciously down into our souls. Now, one more question. What's this worth? What is the net worth of wisdom? I write it that way because if you're online much and I have to be online all the time at work, That's usually always an ad somewhere on the page. If you go to AL.com to read the news, it's always on there. And it's always what is the net worth of. And it's a person that's been in the news. I mean, whether that's Bill Gates, what's the what's the net worth of Bill Gates? Recently, it's been what's the net worth of Bill Gates, wife, because he's divorced. What's the net worth of Jeff Bezos from Amazon? What's the net worth of Elon Musk? This past week, I was reading the news on there. And what was the net worth of Tommy Lee? the drummer from Motley Crue. I'm like, who cares what that is? But people are fascinated about what people are worth, right? There's always a number of publications every single year. Who's in the top 10? Who's in the top 50? Who's in the top 100? 
I look at those sometimes hoping that I'll know one of them so I can ask for something good, right? But I never know any of them. But I do want you to understand what the Bible says is of greatest value. And listen to what Solomon tells his son. And I can't think of any, anything more meaningful to me than the words that I give to my own son. And so Solomon says this to his own son, take my instruction and not silver. He says, take knowledge rather than the choicest gold. For wisdom is better than jewels. And then he goes on and says, all desirable things can not compare. Have you ever communicated that to your son? Or have you told your son, if you be a dentist, you can be super wealthy. I've actually told my son that. If you be a doctor or a lawyer, son, you can drive that car that you've always looked at and liked. But have we been faithful to God in teaching our sons and our daughters that in comparison, the only thing in life that is truly valuable is the knowledge of God and the way of God. Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived, said, listen, if you're going to compare it to the finest gold, if you're going to compare it to silver, if you're going to compare it to jewels, if you're going to compare it to the most desirable things on the planet, you need to understand those things are absolutely worthless in comparison to the wisdom of God. If you do not teach your kids that, they will not hear that from anyone else. You have to convince them of that and you have to be convinced yourself of that or they will never understand that and they will chase things that are of absolutely no value whatsoever. <laughs> These things are absolutely priceless to us. So we're in Job 28, right? Notice how Job describes these. Go back to verse 12. Job asks the question, where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Notice verse 13. Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says wisdom is not in me. The seas say it's not with me either. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it nor silver be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Orpher, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold or glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for articles of fine gold. Coral and crystal are not to be mentioned. The acquisition of wisdom is, that of, is above that of pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where does wisdom come from? Where is the place of understanding? Thus it is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the sky. Abaddon and death say, with our ears we've heard a report about it. God understands its way. God knows its place. Because it is in the fear of the Lord that we have knowledge, that we gain knowledge, and we understand the value of knowledge. What does the world again consider of great value or what does the world consider of great value? Think about this. Wealth, achievement, accomplishments. How many times have we been to a funeral and heard them talk about the great achievements of the man lying in state in the casket? Especially if they're a wealthy man. We talk about all that he's accomplished. We talk about all that he's done, all that he's built, all that he's given. And certainly if these are the things that we'll say over our have said over our own dead bodies, you need to understand that these are the things that we value the most. Dwight told me several years before I stood over his body, when you preach my funeral, you tell him that I was a sinner dying and going to hell until the grace of God rescued me. Why don't we talk about those things at funerals? It's because we don't value those things and understand how precious those things truly are. The mercy of God and the grace of God and the love of God and the wisdom of God. 
Now, Christians, we know better. Church, we know better. We know what wisdom is worth. One last thing, since I've got to wrap this up and I didn't even get to my introduction. I want you to go with me to Genesis 18. And this will be the last passage we turn to. And I just like a, just another minute or two because I actually do have to get to men, right? So if your answer to this, because you know I'm going to eventually get to godly men, if your answer to this as the man of your house to teach your family wisdom and to train them up in the way and to model wisdom, if your answer to that is to simply buy the Bible and to place it somewhere on the coffee table, you need to understand that is not the answer I'm looking for. And if you'll think about that with me for just a second, you'll understand how foolish it is. How would you feel if you sent your kids to school in Brittany's class and she walked out on the first day, she took their textbooks, she set them on their desk, and she left the room and went and sat in the teacher's lounge all day and sipped on coffee. And she did that every day of the school year for the entire school year. And once you got to the end of the year, you questioned her about what in the world are you thinking? And you said, well, I provided everything for them to know. What else would you like me to do? And your response says, I expected you to teach it. I know exactly how that is for Abby right now because school books, and Madeira could say amen to this, are extremely expensive. College textbooks are ridiculous, right? And then you have to pay tuition as well. And if your kid goes off to college and you ask them how they were doing and they say, oh, well, it's kind of weird. And you say, what do you mean weird? Well, I have the textbook you bought me, but every time I go to class, the instructor's never there. They just want us to sit and open the textbook and just rummage through the pages for a little while. I don't think I'm ever going to learn anything. You'd be very upset that you set several thousand dollars to this institution because your expectations is for them to teach them and instruct them. Certainly they would need the text. Can't do it without the text. But you can't do it without instruction either. Now we begin to understand God's plan for the man, especially in the home. Because when you get to Genesis 18, you do understand that this is the first man. This is the father of our faith. This is the first Christian, so to speak, who came to faith in God through grace alone. And when you get to 18, he's confused because God has told him that he's going to be the father of many nations. God told him that you're not going to be able to count your kids. They're going to be like the sand on the seashores or the stars in the skies. And Abraham's scratching his head at that thought. and He's thinking, well, I haven't had a son. How in the world am I going to be the father of nations if I haven't had a son? And so the Lord comes to him in chapter 18 and appears to him. Notice with me verse 1 and verse 2. Now the Lord appeared to him, Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. And when he lifted up his eyes, Abraham looked, and behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran to the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth, and he said, My Lord, right? My Lord. So we understand that these three men, one of them is the Lord. And so the Lord begins to have a conversation with Abraham, and he tells him, notice verse 10, the Lord says to Abraham, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening to him at the tent of the door was behind him. So you understand how that story unfolds. Sarah laughs. But yet the Lord says about this time next year, you're going to have a son. Now, this is the part that I find most amazing because we're a nine months away from having a son. And the Lord speaks to Abraham about his responsibility with that son. Look, if you will, at verse 19. The Lord begins to speak to the other angels there. And notice what the Lord tells them. For I have chosen Abraham so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the what? The way of the Lord. That was God's plan. 
And he started with the very first man and he continues to the nation and will roll into in the weeks ahead into the New Testament. And it's not just the preacher. It's not just the prophets. Fathers, don't exasperate or frustrate your children, but train them up in the fear and the knowledge of the Lord. This is God's plan for the propagation of his wisdom and his way. That men would act like men and do their jobs and train their children in the wisdom and the way of God. We got a long way to go. But it all starts with the fear of God. If you have not come to the Father through a relationship with the Son, you have no source for wisdom whatsoever. If you've come to faith in Christ, you have everything that you need. You may just need some teaching or training yourself, but you do understand that you're merely a conduit in the hands of God. Your responsibility is to let wisdom and truth of the Lord flow through you and into your children so that they can do the same thing when they have children one day. That's the plan of God. Is it your plan? That's the only question. Let's pray.